my name's Aaron. What is your first name? Eric. Eric, it's nice to meet you. Uh, where do you come from? Tooele County. Tooele County. Uh, how long have you been LDS? Member since I was baptized at eight years old. Well, I was actually eight and a half. Have you served a mission? Yes, sir. Where to? Uh, Vietnam. No way. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that, please. Well, it was a great experience. I was uh, actually the fourth one to receive my mission call to Vietnam, and a lot of people are really open to Christianity over there. Um, they come from a Buddhist background or an ancestor worship, so um, the, just the good word of Christ, it really brings uh, great hope for them in their lives. What would you say is the difference between, say, ancestor worship and the LDS view of worship? Um, I, I believe we all respect our ancestors. We just don't worship um, our ancestors as they would, um, as we are taught in the Bible that there's one God and we worship one God. Tell me more, more about your mission, please. Um, what would you like to know? Interesting conversations that you've had. Interesting conversations. Uh, the conversations weren't that lengthy because Vietnamese uh, tonal language, which was quite a difficult language to learn, but um, a lot of our conversations were based on how can we help you. If, if anything, we, we, one thing we, I really enjoyed that we did was we provided a free English practice. So we practiced speaking English with native people that wanted to speak English or we would go and provide service for people at their homes. And the conversations were just based on how can we help you? And especially uh, a country that there's a, quite a few um, poor people, a lot of people that need help. But as a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ, we're not allowed to donate money, but we're allowed to donate our time and our service to help them. So it was, that's what my, our conversations are based on. How can we help you? What are some of the other religious backgrounds that you, of people that you met? Um, let's see. A lot of them were Buddhists. A lot, there's not actually a lot of religion over there. They'll say they're Buddhist, but what that entails is that's what their parents, that's what their grandparents did, and it's just that ancestor worship, which they'll in turn relate to Buddhism. But I don't know too much about Buddhism, yeah. but I know that they respect their ancestors a lot, and that's a cultural thing that I really appreciate about Vietnam, is that um, respect for your ancestors and to take care of them and to love them and to provide a way for them because they, they were the ones that helped you, they raised you, and they took care of you. So it's sort of your, your turn to give back to them and help them. Were you able to meet any evangelical Christians or Protestants or Baptists or something of that nature? Um, not myself. I, I did not get the opportunity to. Um, I know there was a, a group called uh, um, Hoi Duk Joy, which is just basically a, a group. I don't know exactly what their religion was, but I know that... Um, between the Vietnamese community and this religious group, they weren't very welcome because um, they sort of disrespected the idea of ancestor worship. And religion over there, there's only seven religions that are officially recognized in the country. It being a communist country, there's always, there's a lot of regulations you need to follow by. And um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was actually the seventh um, religion uh, recognized in Vietnam. So. There's not, it's not really open to religion in a sense, but it's a beginning process over there. So back here in Utah, you grew up in Tooele, is that correct? Uh, I was born in uh, Gwinnett, Georgia, when I and moved to uh, Utah in 2001. So I've been in Tooele, Utah for about 19 years. No, 18 years, my math is correct. Did you ever have any born-again Christian or evangelical acquaintances or friends growing up or here in Utah? Um, yeah, I mean, once I went, I went to a Baptist church. No, it wasn't Baptist. It was, um, I don't know what it is, but I, I have gone to other um, um, sacraments and worship, uh, worship opportunities, which has been a really a great experience, um, how much you can feel God's love, even no matter where you are, you're able to God loves all of his children. We're all his children, and he loves each and every one of us. How you can go to any different denomination and to fill of God's love just as abundantly if you go anywhere else. Were you able to have any interesting conversations with your evangelical acquaintances or friends about faith and doctrine and teaching? 
No, I, I wasn't, but it was just more of a, a friendship builder. Hey, want to come to church with me? Yeah, all right. And that was our common ground. We had faith in Jesus Christ and God, and that's what brought us together. And it was just a, it was a really great opportunity to build a friendship and to um, have a center around Christ and our Heavenly Father. And it was a really amazing experience. Now, I know the Latter-day Saint movement is a restorationist movement. And so in that light, what would you say are some of the most important differences between the Latter-day Saint faith and, say, mainstream Christianity? I don't think there's a, much of a difference because um, we believe in Jesus Christ, don't we? And the difference would be we believe in uh, the restoration, um, which was we believe that when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he um, founded his church. He brought the priesthood, which is God's authority and um, power to do his work here on this earth. And we believe that when Jesus Christ was crucified, that he, the priesthood was not passed down um, because um, when he gave the priesthood to the 12 apostles, but um, after Jesus Christ was executed or crucified, um, the 12 apostles were soon after um, executed, killed, or how martyred, however you want to pronounce it. And we believe that that chain of authority was lost, that the authority to do God's work. And so that's where we believe in a restoration is that God came to this earth, uh, appeared to avoid Joseph Smith, do you think there's any important other uh, Christian doctrines that ought to have been preserved? I, I know there's this term, great apostasy. Ooh, sorry. Um, I pushed a button. Okay, we're good. Are there any other doctrines that you think were lost after the apostles died out that the Latter-day Saint movement restored? Say about the nature of God and salvation and so forth. Hmm. In the sense of nature and God and Jesus Christ and so forth. Um, no, because I believe Jesus Christ taught it all. And I don't know what was lost and what... I guess I sort of don't know. Some of the teachings that the Latter-day Saint movement has taught that are supposed to bring back uh, a belief or teaching that the historic Christian movement has since abandoned or lost or forgotten about what well, let me ask a question what has the i guess i don't know for myself but what would you say that was lost between christianity and to now and days what the basics i don't think any of it was lost um, i think that the core of true christianity has been preserved even the authority stuff uh -huh. so yeah interesting i yeah, we all have our own spin on it. I, I don't know exactly what was lost. I just believe that that would be the biggest point is that we believe that the uh, priesthood authority of God was lost. Um, and that would be my biggest belief is that if the priesthood authority of God is lost, how can you continue to do his work? And that's where we believe in a restoration through the prophet Joseph Smith. Would you mind if I listed a few teachings that might uh, be things that probably divide uh, the Latter-day Saint movement with mainstream Christianity and see if you think that they're genuine points of separation. I wouldn't mind the sharing, but I don't believe we should try to distinguish um, separation. I believe we should all be working together as Christians, as, a, as a individuals that believe in Jesus Christ. I don't believe we should try to if I could put it this way, these are things that I believe every Christian should believe and are actually things that every Christian does believe and they have a very unifying effect, uh, a unifying force, a unifying spirit to Christians. They're things that Christians celebrate together, uh, not just as a matter of like creedal affirmation, but just like seeing about them. So one of them is that uh, is the nature of God. And uh, when we as Christians worship God, say at my church, uh, I go to a little church called the Mission Church in South Jordan, and there's probably uh, 170, 180 Christian churches in Utah that are sort of in the same family. Yeah. And they're, they're people I would greet as fellow believers. Yeah. The, the God that we sing to and worship, he's the first God there ever was. So there's no um, genealogy of other generations of gods 
that preceded him. There's no, to put it, put it in another term, there's no heavenly grandfather. There's no father of the father. Part of what makes God so amazing, for example, when an atheist says, so where did God come from? Christians say, God didn't come from. He always was. Well, who taught God how to be God? No one taught God how to be God. Uh, the, the Bible calls him the most high. He's the first and the last. Uh, he's, uh, he, he, he even has a kind of bragging right where he says, no one's ever counseled me or taught me wisdom. Uh, no one's ever been before me. Um, I, I'm the first and the last, like I said. So those are all things that the Bible teaches. And we approach God as the source of everything good and true and beautiful. So God's not like downstream. Yeah. Like you might learn piano or artistry I from. I I've been trying to oh, yeah. play the piano. It's very difficult, but yeah. If you were to learn piano, you'd probably learn it from a teacher who yeah. learned it from someone else, a yeah, teacher, yeah. someone, or maybe YouTube, depending. <laughs> yeah, and it, through some sort of channel of yeah. t- a teaching from other people. When Christians approach God, we approach God as the one who's never had to receive um, anything from another. Uh, all the gifts come from him. So this is, I'll just, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll quote a verse to you and see what you think about it. Okay. In Romans 11, because I've got the mic in my hand and I've been hogging it here for a second. In Romans 11, Paul says, who has ever known the mind of the Lord? Who has ever been God's counselor? Who has ever given God a gift that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. Uh, what do you think that means? I think that's interesting. Who's who's speaking in, in Romans? Paul. Uh, oh, Paul. Yeah. In, inspired by God. So dual authorship. OK. So Paul is asking who's Paul talking to? He's writing a letter, I think, from Corinth to the Roman people as a broad Christian argument for the gospel. Oh, (laughs) interesting. I just think it's interesting that he asks that in the form of a question, like, who do do we praise? Like, who does that praise go to but God himself? I don't know. I like that. That's a good scripture. So if someone said that Latter-day Saints, not stereotypically, but in general or often, took the position that as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may be, to the effect of God was once a man who became a God, and that we can become what he became. Uh, That God himself went through an experience to become who he is today, and that he submitted to, the Heavenly Father submitted to, his Heavenly Father. Would that resonate with you, or would that seem familiar to you? Yeah, it does. I'm, I'm really glad that you know that piece of information. That's really cool that you can recite that and know that doctrine. I think that's, I believe that to be true. I, I mean, everything started from somewhere. Well, where could we say God started from? If there was no God before, or if there was no, if he didn't have a father himself, did it just start out of nowhere? I guess what, what would your perception on that be? Has God always been around since, since what? So if, if you don't, don't mind, I'll answer it with um, Psalm 90 verse 2. Really neat verse. It says, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. To everlasting, you are God. If you don't mind, I'll add one more. In um, Revelation chapter 4, the angels are surrounding God. And they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So part of what makes God amazing and worthy of worship is that he's been God from everlasting. And he won't stop being God from everlasting. And he's holy, but he's not just holy. He's holy, holy, holy. So it's superlative, ex, you know, uh, accentuated, you know, yeah. emphasized, and that he always was, and he is, and he always will be. What are your thoughts on that? I'm very grateful to know that, like you said, he always will be God, and 
it's always comforting to know that God will always be there. I think a lot of people nowadays, they don't really have faith in God. They don't have a knowledge of God. They don't have a testimony of God. But how comforting it is for you and I and probably everyone else that believes in God to know that God is always there forever and always. What about the past component of that uh, from Everlasting? Yeah, the past component is an interesting one to understand where our perspective is, whether or not there was a God or maybe not even a God. If God had a father, I think that's an interesting belief we can have, whether or not we believe the Bible or not to say we don't believe the Bible, but the belief in the Bible saying that and the interpretation of the scripture saying that there was there's only one God. He is God. Never will be another God. He's a God from everlasting, as the word you said, everlasting. I think that's an interesting belief, and we can all have our own belief whether or not it is. Like you said, there's many Christians and um, many other people that believe that there probably was, that God did have a father, and then there's also people that believe that God is everlasting, never was anyone before him, and never be a God after him. Let's circle back around. I know you probably have to get somewhere, but um, um, there... There's an analogy here that might be helpful to us. Um, when I tell my wife, you're the best wife in the universe. You are the best cook in the universe. There is either implicitly or explicitly a very important qualifier there for me. So you're, you're the best friend of the whole universe for me. And uh, she might not be the best uh, wife among wives, generically speaking, and she might not be the best cook, you know, maybe, (laughs) maybe. (laughs) It's debatable. (laughs) If you're talking to her, then it's really debatable. She is. But when I tell her those things, there's a kind of romantic, loving hyperbole there. And um, I'll give you one more example. Um, Take my father. My father is a good dad. He's a good father, lives over in Virginia. Um... He's my dad. He's a good dad. But let's say, for the sake of argument, he wasn't the best of dads. Let's say that he wasn't growing up the strongest of dads or the smartest of dads or the most caring of dads, um, the best qualitative of dads. But he's my dad. Now, when I consider God... Is it important for me to relate to him like that? In other words, if I could just add to the question, and I'll hand the mic back to you. Is it important that the God that we worship be literally and absolutely the best God there is or ever will be or ever was? In other words, if I went to heaven to a kind of family reunion, and I saw, pardon the, um, the language, I, I know it's not language to be flippantly used, so I understand that, but if I went to a sort of a heavenly family reunion with my heavenly uncles and heavenly grandfathers, uh, uh, and, I, and I saw the ancestry of the gods, and I saw a whole array of other deities, and let's just say most of them were more knowledgeable more glorious, more powerful, and more loving and more experienced gods than my God, uh, would that be a problem? Um, that, I, hmm. But isn't our, our God perfect? He's sinless now. I know that the Latter-day Saint movement teaches that he's at least perfect now. But that doesn't necessarily mean, as I understand, you can correct me with your view, as I understand the Latter-day Saint movement, that doesn't necessarily mean he's the most knowledgeable or that he isn't still learning or that he isn't still growing in his glory or that he's necessarily the most impressive of all the gods. That's interesting. That's one thing I wonder about is like when we go to heaven, I, I, I believe I've heard that when we go to heaven that we will have a perfect knowledge of all things. Have you ever heard of that? 
Or is that just something I... From a Latter-day Saint perspective. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So I don't know if I just heard that or where it blew, blew in from, but I've heard that, that we will have a perfect knowledge of all things. What do you mean by that? I'm not sure what... Uh, a perfect knowledge of all things. That's the thing I don't understand is that, well, are we going to have a perfect knowledge of all things, but then are we going to continue to grow and excel in heaven? And I guess from what I've, what I've learned is that um, we're not going to be like perfect. We're not going to know everything, but we're all going to continue to learn and grow. And I guess if that's a sense and the belief would be um, that God himself had the same opportunity as we do now. We have the opportunity to become gods and kings, queens, priestesses. And if that's the case, then we're not going to be perfect. We're not going to be the most all-knowing. That our God is probably going to be more knowledgeable than we are because God... He would be more than us, but maybe there are ancestor gods that are even more than him? I believe so, yeah. I think that could be a very good possibility because if God's learning the same as we're going to learn as if we go to heaven, we're not going to learn, we're not going to have as much experience, I guess, as much time on the clock. Because I, I know time is an earthly perspective, but even so from an earthly perspective, that God's probably had more time to live than us. So help me understand from a Latter-day Saint perspective, it sounds like a weird and simple question. Okay. What's so wrong about ancestor worship? Just because we're taught that they're to worship God. Why worship God and not an ancestor? It's one of the commandments God has given us. So I guess the question is, why? Like, what's so bad about worshiping grandpa instead of worshiping my spirit father well we all know of our god here if you don't know about god's father how are you going to supposed to worship him maybe it's just a matter of ignorance maybe yeah maybe so it, it, we'll try this on and um let me put my specially evangelist my, my evangelist hat has been on the entire time but it'll specially be visible here okay um, it seems like in scripture, for sure, not it seems like, it, it, is, it is for sure in scripture that one of the reasons we should worship God is that he's holy and always has been, yeah. that he's God yeah. and always has been, yeah. that he's the first of all the gods, yeah. that he's the most high, yeah. that he's never learned anything, yeah. that he is the source of everything good and true and beautiful, and that um, he's never received a gift. He's never said, thank you. I've never had that before. He's, ne he's never received a gift and been and, and out of deficiency, as though he didn't already own all things. So part of what makes idolatry so bad is that we're exchanging the truth, this beautiful truth of God as most high creator, the first of all, most high. We're exchanging that and we're settling for something less. So, in a sense, from the traditional Christian perspective, which I would say is the biblical perspective, to worship any other deity other than the first of all yeah. is a form of idolatry. And to worship someone that we think is our spirit father but who is not the first of all, is just another form of ancestor worship. What are your thoughts on that? I know it's a very critical and uh, it's very important. I think, well, you have to look at the nature of God. God is God. We are humans. We are, why don't I worship my dad right now? What, why would I worship my father if he passes away or if he's living now? And it's the nature of God. God is God. God is perfect. God is almighty. God is loving. God is perfectly caring. And he always was? No, be, I, I don't believe so. Because I, I believe that he did have the same opportunity as us. And if he had the same opportunity as us, we're not... Are we perfect beings right now? No. So just, just to make that clear, we're sinners... And we need to confess our sins and we need 
the atonement, do you think that maybe Heavenly Father needed the atonement of another Savior, needed to confess his sins? Ooh, that's a good question. I wonder about that one myself. But I, I imagine that there must have been some way provided for him to to receive forgiveness for his... To be kind of an ancestor of a different uh, different, realm. different realm that accomplished another atonement for another set. Whether or not it was an atonement, I don't know. But I definitely believe there was a way provided for him. But that's it. I don't know. I don't really know how God's life was. They they don't actually talk about that too much. It's just the belief that there was God was in God did have a opportunity like we did. That's why we have an opportunity as well. Can you see after discussing this why mainstream Christians or evangelicals think there's a pretty big chasm? between the Latter-day Saint movement and biblical Christianity. I can see that there would be different points of views, and um, but I, I don't see why it would have to separate or push one another apart from all, us all being God's children and to loving one another. As I believe, for me, it's a personal belief that we're all God, God's children and we should all care for one another, no matter what it is no matter what your faith is, whether you believe in Thor or whatever, whatever whatever you might believe in that, we should all care for one another and we should love one another and try to follow Jesus Christ's example to care. And When you say we're all God's children, I, I'd be interested to know what you think about that because that language in America might mean something as simple as, well, God created us and he cares about us and he, there's a caring relationship he has over us providentially and he has affection for us. But I think that it seems like in the Latter-day Saint movement, that might mean something more than that. What, what do you think? Um, I don't know if it would be more as any, it, the only way it would be more is that we understand more fully of God's nature and his plan. But I believe God, I know that God loves us. He cares for us. He. To be children of God, though, um, what does that mean in the Latter-day Saint worldview or framework? What's the sort of the background of that? That he's our literal father, our father in heaven, our heavenly father. When you say literal, I'm not really quite sure what you mean. I, I know what that means on earth, but on heaven, I'm not quite sure. Let's t retract the word literal then. He's our heavenly father. Uh, just to press it for details for a bit, um, is there a heavenly mother involved in the... Uh, what was previously called literal uh, sonship and daughtership that we have from what I've been taught that there is a, a heavenly mother but we don't know of her name because um, God cares about his wife so much that he wouldn't want her name to be taken in vain so like we know God's name and people say take his name in vain a lot I believe there's a heavenly, fa heavenly mother Mother. Is that an, an important aspect of being children of God? Yeah, I think definitely. We all, well, how do a uh, man and woman conceive? You have to have a man and woman, same as Adam and Eve. So, so in, the, in the Christian point of view, the biblical Christian point of view, God created us. What he begets is of his nature. What he creates is of a different nature. So we are not begotten of God. Uh -huh. We are created by God, male and female. So we are in his image, representing him, reflecting him. Uh, we have a dignity. And so for, for example, I had to treat my neighbors uh, with a dignity and a love and a respect, irrespective of their contribution to society, irrespective of whether they're bad neighbors or they're mean or they're difficult people. Um, uh, so I want to treat people uh, like I want to be treated, and I want to treat people like royal representatives of the of the Creator. What that doesn't mean is that God required a heavenly mother to have a kind of uh, you know a sexual union or a sexual relationship. That God, the the pattern in Scripture is that God says, for example, "Let there be light," uh -huh. and there's light. Yeah. Let there be an expanse, and there's an expanse. Let there be animals and plants, 
And there is. God creates by the effortless, raw power of his word. I am a creation of God. I am not a child of God. The good news of the gospel, which the New Testament teaches, is that when Jesus came, he came to his own. His own did not receive him. But to as many as did receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. And believing Jesus uh, involves immediately, when, when I say believing Jesus, I mean trusting him alone for my salvation, for my hope, trusting who he really is. When a Christian does that for the very first moment, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And having received the gift of the Holy Spirit, they no longer are under the spirit of slavery to fall back to fear, but they have received the spirit of adoption. So now they're adopted children of God. They went from being not children of God to being born again, uh, born of God, rebirthed, adopted, and given the gift of eternal life. Uh, not because we have a heavenly mother and not because we come from above, but because Jesus comes from above and he grants that as a gift to his people. What do you children of God? So I guess I would just, we're going to go into another deep conversation, but I guess it would just be the point of view that when there was a creation and Jesus Christ and Satan, that Jesus Christ chose to follow God's plan on this earth and we all chose to follow Jesus Christ at that point in time. So if that's the case, then we all chose to follow Jesus Christ, then wouldn't we be children of God? Because there's nowhere in you said that if we that Jesus Christ allowed us that that gift to be children of God if we follow Him. If we believe in Him, we become adopted. But there's nowhere in the New Testament or the Old Testament that teaches that we come from above, or that we pre-existed. Um, it, there's nowhere in the New Testament that teaches that there was a kind of heavenly council where we had to listen to a proposal and receive or accept or reject a plan that seems to come entirely from uh, later LDS teachings. If, if you were stuck in a prison cell, for example, for some horrible reason, sorry, uh, and all you had was the Bible, mm -hmm. and you wanted to learn about the nature of man, the origin of man, what you would come away with if you were reading the Bible as a good student and, and, and uh, keeping yourself restricted to what the Bible teaches, you would, you would come away learning that man comes from below and Jesus comes from above. That we come after Jesus and Jesus comes before us. That we had our beginning on earth and Jesus comes above from heaven. That we were not sent to come to earth, that we had our beginning on earth. Uh, that is in the Gospel of John, in particular. Uh, John the Baptist, his earthly birthday is before Jesus' earthly birthday. And so uh, Jesus comes, in a sense, after John the Baptist. But when John the Baptist introduces Jesus, he says, this man is more important than I am because he existed before I was born. And later in the Gospel of John, it said that Jesus comes from above and we come from below. Or Jesus says of Abraham, before Abraham was, I am. And they pick up stones to throw at him. So, yeah, it, in the Gospel of John, there seems to be a really deep sense that what makes Jesus special is that he preexisted and we didn't. He comes from above and we didn't. What are your thoughts on that? I just think about that's why I, I'm grateful for modern revelation, revelation that Joseph Smith had because it does continue to teach us and teaches us the fullness of the gospel and it, God continues to speak to us and to teach us and I mean the Book of Mormon that the Book of Mormon is further light and further knowledge and truth of God's plan. 
Appreciate it. You know, just uh, as a summary from our conversation, since we've covered material, in your view, as of this conversation, what would you say are, are some of the biggest and most significant doctrinal differences between the Latter-day Saint movement and mainstream Christianity? Um, further knowledge that those that haven't read the Book of Mormon and haven't studied, like you said, if we were in a cell and only had the Bible, what would our belief be at the end of the day? Well, if you had the Book of Mormon as well to study, what would your belief be then at the end of the day? So I, I believe there are some, some points that have been taught to us that take the opportunity to study the Book of Mormon, which is another testament of Jesus Christ. And um, So if you take the Book of Mormon and you take the other LDS scriptures and you take the teachings of the LDS prophets and apostles and you take what the LDS people in general believe, given our conversation, what are some points of difference in terms of the things we covered? Um, things that we covered, one would be that there wasn't a God before, there was no one before God. God didn't have a father and there was no one before that. Um, as well, let's see, I think um, heavenly perspective on um, where we came from. Um, I think there's different beliefs on that or different knowledge. What it means to be a child of God and whether that involved a heavenly mother. Yeah, that as well, um, where we came from. Um, what else did we cover? Let's see. Maybe the human pre-existence? Yeah, pre-earth life. No. As I, I mentioned that, where we came from and okay. why, yeah. Let's see, what else did we, I think we talked about, I feel like we talked about more. What other topics did we? Those are big topics. They yeah, we might have just covered those couple yeah. and we had some conversations that branched off from that. But Let's, let's just add one more. one more. It was just one more. Okay. You mentioned uh, authority and priesthood early on in the conversation. Could you tell me a little bit about the significance of authority and priesthood in the Latter-day Saint movement? Yeah, so we believe that the priesthood keys were restored when, um, well, Joseph Smith um, received revelation from God the Father, restored his church, and received um, the um, the Aaronic priesthood from John the Baptist, and then after that, received the Melchizedek priesthood by Peter, James, and John by the laying on of hands. So we believe that um, through these uh brings me a good question are they resurrected or not <laughs> so uh, we believe that they receive that authority from God as they w have been as they once held the keys of God and restored it on the earth again so just to dig a little deeper into that it sounds like authority in your view is I want to use the word bequeathed or uh, transferred or transmitted through one person to another through uh, through what how is through the laying on of hands through the laying on of hands yeah um yeah. and it has to be in particular done by someone who has the authority yeah. yeah it's like having something or it's like not having something and then trying to give someone something that you don't have so uh just just for clarity um, and, you know, honestly, just to kind of get you to own it, you know, like, like, you know, what it really, really what it really means and uh, implies do people, well, I'll start with this. What, what does a Latter-day Saint such as yourself have the authority to do? <laughs> I'll even add to that. What did you have authority to do as a missionary? As a missionary, uh, I had the authority to bless and pass the sacrament, prepare the sacrament. Um, I had the authority to baptize. Um, I had the authority to... Call me out, God. Um, let's see. You weren't, uh, you didn't do homework for the on-the-street on interview. Yeah. I understand. Um, the priesthood authority to give someone a blessing or give someone a blessing with the priesthood authority. Um... So things like baptism and the sacrament and blessing people, the certain kinds of blessings, 
it sounds like those are able to be done by you, or, or at least you have the authority or had the authority to do so. And that, and here's the sort of the implication part. Do you think that anyone outside the LDS church has the valid authority to do those same things? No. So do you think that mainstream or evangelical Christians are baptizing people with proper authority? I do not. I appreciate the honesty. I'm not trying to uh, make you feel awkward about that, but um, it, I appreciate the, the honesty. Um, so authority seems like a pretty big deal in the Latter-day Saint tradition. And it, it was even so important as to, you, you mentioned it in terms of the, um, the apostasy and the restoration. It was a, a super big, important part of that. The evangelical, I would say biblical Christian view of authority is that God gives power and permission and prerogative authority uh, usually by the word of his mouth. Who did he give the authority to initially? I'm sorry, say it again. So the word of his mouth, where's the, is that a literal sense, like the word of his mouth you have to hear his voice to? Um, the word of his mouth, the what do we know as a mouth? A mouth is a, a an expression for his his word. Just an expression. So I don't audibly have to hear the word, but I do need to somehow receive the word. What if you take in a literal sense of the word of his mouth? Then have we received your belief? Have you received his the word of his mouth? His authority. His verbal expressions. I'll say that. So they might not be audible. Verbal what expressions. Did you read in the Bible, what did you read in the Bible? The word of his mouth. In the four Gospels. Yeah, so you did read that, correct? Yeah. So did you hear that? Uh, literally read it out loud, heard it. Yeah. <laughs> but did you hear God's, hear it from God's mouth? So not trying to be cute, but uh, evangelicals believe, not trying to be tricky or uh, play word game. When evangelicals read the word of God, we believe we are reading the very words of God. So we don't see the Bible as sort of one step removed from the Word of God or being a report of God's Word. We see it as the very Word of God. So if you, if you said, I want to hear God speak to me, you could literally open up the Gospel of John and read aloud the words of Jesus and experience the very words, the living words of Jesus Christ, which are not like milk. They don't have a shelf life. They don't taper off or diminish in their authority. They have an enduring authority. Uh, yeah, what do you think about that? It makes me think of something I once heard recently that um, Christians believe that when they take the sacrament, the bread and water, they believe that to be the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ. In a sense, would you be a cannibal if you did that? It sounds like a Catholic view. Uh, yeah, a Catholic view. There we go. That's That's what it is. That's Definitely don't share that view. That's for sure. <laughs> that's what that's what I made me think of. It it's really cool to look at how the Bible depicts God exercising His authority. For example, in Genesis one, He says, "Let there be light," uh -huh. and it's just there's, there's light. <laughs> <laughs> and and He says, "Let there be plants and animals. Let there be an expanse." Let, he He goes through the step the the days of creation, mm -hmm. and He. <laughs> it might not seem as significant to us today, but. It's significant that in the book of Genesis, set against history, the God of Israel is, and this sounds very strange to say out loud, he's not having to have a kind of contest or battle with other deities that fight against him and somehow put up a fight. Uh, God can literally just say the words and the universe obeys. Uh, another strange thing that might not seem significant to us today, but is the way that God showed his glory. Uh, there is a an absence in Genesis 1 of any sexual activity, which again, sounds really weird to modern ears, but in ancient pagan creation myths, the gods typically create through uh, some sort of sexual activity or battling other deities. The God of the Bible just says, let there be light, and there's light. So what's really cool about Jesus is that when he comes to earth, 
There's like neat stories about this. Jesus is in the boat, for example, sleeping like a baby with his disciples. I've heard it. I've heard it. I like it. They, they say, does that, thou care not that we perish? Same one? I think, I think the other translation is, we're going to die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then he calms the water. Yeah. He literally looks up and he says, be quiet. And the storm stops. And his disciples sort of freak out. They're like, who are we dealing with with this? After his most famous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, yeah. Jesus descends the mountain and they say, wow, Jesus, he's not like the scribes. He teaches as one who has authority. So when he comes down the mountain, he meets a leper who's got skin condition and he um, heals the man by simply touching him which is sort of a no-no if you're a Jew trying to be ritually pure. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to touch a leper. Uh, but Jesus doesn't become unclean. He stays clean and he cleans the man. Then he meets a man called a centurion, which is like a Roman commander. And this Roman commander sends for Jesus because the Roman commander has a servant who's sick to the point of death. So... The man says, please heal my servant. And Jesus says, I'll come. But the Roman commander communicates, no, 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 no. I'm not worthy to have you step inside my house. And I'm a man of authority. And I know how authority works. I know that, Jesus, you can just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus was super impressed, and he said, I haven't seen faith like this, even in all of Israel. Go, it will be done for you. So uh, one more story. Maybe maybe a few more, but one more, yeah, at least. More. Okay. More. Jesus is... 35-minute drive back to Tawah. I understand. <laughs> we'll wrap it up. Jesus is in a house, crowded, and there are three buddies. One of them is unable to walk. So they get up on top of the roof of the crowded house, Somehow they puncture a hole. And they lower him through. Yeah. Yeah, they dis they lower their friend on some sort of mat or cot. Yeah, and he heals the, the gentleman. Is that one that two priests, the priests say, like, they say to themselves, like, how does he have the authority or power to heal this man? And then Jesus says to them, is it easier to say, um, take up thy cot and rise and go forth than it is to... What did he say? <laughs> yeah, let, 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 let's just tell the story. Uh, Jesus looks up at the man. who's he, He's really impressed by their faith. And he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And, 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 then, <laughs> and uh, like you were, you were telling the story, in the, in the background, Jesus could sense, he, he knew somehow that they were thinking, this man is blaspheming. Yep. Only God has the authority to forgive sins. Who do you think you are? And Jesus says, I know what you're thinking back there. And like you said, what's what's easier, what's harder uh, uh, to say to a man, your sins are forgiven, or to say to a man who can't walk, get up and take up your mat and walk right on out. And Jesus says to show you that the Son of Man has the authority here to do both. I'm paraphrasing. Son, get up, take up your mat, and walk right on out. So the pattern in the four Gospels seems to be that when Jesus wants to give forgiveness and healing and when he wants to stop a storm, sometimes he might touch a leper. Yeah. And that, that kind of makes sense because it kind of makes sense because Jesus is making a point there. But Jesus doesn't have to. And with the centurion, especially, he realized, the centurion realized, I'm a man of authority. I've got men under me, and I can tell them, go, and they go, come, and they come, do this, and they do this. Jesus, you can just say the word, and it will be done. So he can heal remotely. He can forgive remotely. He can stop a storm remotely. He can cast out demons by his word. And at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, all authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and baptize in the name of... Uh, make disciples, he says, baptize, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit 
and I'll be with you to the end of the, end of the age. So here in summary is what I would say is the difference between the Latter-day Saint movement and what, what I would say is biblical Christianity. Biblical Christians worship the first God there ever was. He's the most high. Uh, there's no ancestry above him or previous to him. We, can't, we get the privilege of worshiping this God as the one from whom everything good, true, and beautiful comes from. All things are from him and through him and to him. And so we don't have to talk to God like I talk to my wife. Like, you're the best for me. Or uh, you're the best dad for me. When we say God is the best, we don't have to use hyperbole. We, as Christians, quite literally mean it. And what that means is we're worshiping God as he is. To worship any other God is idolatry. It's a big letdown. It's blasphemy. It's, it's, uh, it's a settling for something infinitely less. So having been created on earth, having our beginning on earth, being under God, being valued by God, we ought to love each other and worship God for everything he is. But there's this deep, deep sin corruption problem in you and I. We have a bent. We have a kind of uh, a spiritual DNA that is corrupt. And our bent is not to worship the first of all gods. Our bent is not to thank and honor and bless and worship the most high God. And our bent is not to love, truly love, our enemies, our neighbors. We have corruption in the way we deal with other people and the way we deal with God. So the good news is not that man became a God. It's that the Most High God became a man. That the God who is eternal and omnipotent became a weak little baby and he grew up and he lived as someone who's different who was sent from above and the the good news is that this Jesus died on the cross and he made a full payment entirely on the cross for all the sins that I've ever ever committed and there's two beautiful things about that one is it's not just a shameful humiliating public execution it's the display of God's love for me that he really loves me secondly um, God is vindicating his own righteousness showing that he is just and he can forgive people justly and he further vindicates himself by right raising from the dead three days later the check is cleared he he owns death he owns creation he is not conquered by death he has paid the penalty for sins so those who trust in christ alone those who declare bankruptcy those who say i don't deserve a temple recommend those who say i'm not worthy and i'll never be worthy in and of myself Christ alone is worthy. Those who trust this Jesus, this God who has always been God, have the free gift of eternal life, the free gift of the forgiveness of sins, and a permanent relationship as an adopted son forever. What do you think and uh, how would you like to close the conversation? Well, Thank you for sharing with me. I really, I really appreciate it. And like, there's a lot I need to learn. And it helps open my perspective that I need to study more of what I believe and study what others believe. Um, but continue to build that commonality with others and about Jesus Christ and um, of a love of a love of Jesus Christ ourselves that we have for Him. And I'm grateful for the opportunity I've had to speak with you. And I'm grateful that your willingness to um, stand out here in the cold and to um, share what you believe with others because I know there are still people out there that don't have a knowledge of Jesus Christ in whatever form it might be. They might believe that this is 
this is it, this is the end, this is all that we have, but that there is a brighter hope for each and every one of us. And so I've been grateful for that. And uh, thank you for sharing with me tonight. Thank you. And just to be very clear, I hope I've gently but clearly communicated. We do serve different gods and we have a very different Jesus and we have a very different hope and a very different spirit and a very different gospel. And I would, as a neighbor and as a believer in Jesus, warn you that the God that you're worshiping is not the Most High, and therefore it is idolatry and blasphemy and sin to be repented of and a false hope and a false gospel. So my warning to you is that the differences are severe enough to be a matter of heaven or hell and life and death. The good news is that God loves you and he's reaching out to you even now and he wants you to inspect his word and get to know him through what the Bible says. I'll let you have the last word. Um, that's sort of sort of uneasing to me because I, there's so many people out there that have a belief in something else and for your belief to say that's damning, that you it's the difference between hell and heaven that's very difficult because I don't believe a, a God that cares people, whatever, if it might be a different belief in Jesus Christ, would want to see someone go to hell. So I, I think that would be my final comment that that's sort of, sort of uneasy for me and sort of whatever I can do to just share what I believe and um, try to believe that there is an opportunity for all men because God is merciful and loving no matter what you believe, that there is an opportunity that you're not going to be cast down to hell for what you believe, even if you're trying to do what's right, because people are going to believe what they believe, whether it might be contrary to what other people believe, that if you're trying to be a good person, God's going to respect that. God's not going to say, go to hell, live a miserable, have a miserable life for eternity. But... Once again, I thank you for your time and for the opportunity I had to speak with you. Thanks to you as well.